Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, let's stand and worship together. Come on, let's rejoice in our God today because he's done great things. Amen.
to see everybody. I want to welcome you to Indian Rocks. My name is Aaron, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And uh, hey, would you join me in thanking our worship team? Don't they do such a great job every week leading us so well? I, I, I am learning this service is better at clapping on beat than the previous service. So that was great leadership. Kevin, thank you for that. Hey, we're glad that you're here. Even if this is your very first time in the building, you've never been here before, we're really, really glad that you're here. And if you come every single week, I'm so glad that you're here. It's just not the same without you. And today we're going to have a great time worshiping God together. But when you're here, we want you to feel like family. So why don't we take just a moment, let's greet one another, maybe give a high five, a handshake. Let's welcome everybody to church today. Go ahead and find your seats. Find your seats. All right. Some of the friendliest people in all of Pinellas County right here, and we're glad that you're here with us, with us today. Hey, we're going to have a great time worshiping God together, and on your way in, you should have received something like this. Go ahead and pull this out. This is a, a program. There's a lot of information in here and ways that you can get connected in the life of our church. Uh, on the back, there's a place where you can take some notes during the Bible study a little bit later. We want you to follow along and and uh, maybe jot down a couple of things. And then at the very bottom, you're gonna see this connect card. Why don't we all go ahead and tear off the connect card, take a moment, fill that out. We really wanna connect with you. And most importantly, we wanna know how we can pray for you. So uh, go ahead and fill that out. Let us know how we can be praying for you or your family. And then a little bit later in the service, you can just drop this in the offering bucket as it comes by. And uh, we'll, we'll take some time this week to pray specifically by name for you. Well, today in Christian churches all over the world, believers are celebrating what's called Palm Sunday. And this is a day that the believers remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and all the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were waving palm branches. Now today, um, we're gonna sing some songs that remind us that Jesus is the Savior. Because the word Hosanna literally means save us, save us. Some of you have come into this worship service. You come into this church today, and you need God to show up and save you from something. Maybe you need God to save a relationship. Maybe you need God to save something going on on the job, something going on in family. You need salvation. You need God to come in and bring salvation into your life. And the greatest salvation he can bring is the forgiveness of sins that he offers because he was crucified on a cross for our sin. He was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And today we're going to look at that story, and it's always encouraging when we get to study God's Word together. In just a minute, we're going to stand and we're going to sing some great songs to God and about God. All of these songs have been very carefully selected. The words come straight out of the Bible, and so even if these are new songs to you, I want to encourage you to sing along. We're not just singing to one another, we're singing to God in heaven. So I want you to try to sing along with us. And uh, then we're going to have a chance to give back to the work of God. If you're new around here, if you're a guest with us today, there's no expectation that you participate. You're certainly welcome to. This is a great place to give. But that's a chance for our members and attenders to fund the ministry of God through this church. Then we're going to have a Bible study. We're going to have some time to pray together. And today we're going to have uh, something really, really special. You're going to get to hear from some of our fifth grade young leaders. Now, we at Indian Rocks, we, we don't believe that these children are the church of tomorrow. We believe they're the church of today. And we're giving them meaningful responsibilities. So these, these uh, students that you hear here in just a minute, they have all applied for this leadership program. They've interviewed. They're taking on meaningful responsibility in their church. And I know you're going to be blessed to hear them in just a moment. 
Now, before we do any of that, I think it's helpful to take a moment and pray. And I like to get on my knees. The, the word worship literally means to bow low. And there's something special about just getting your body in a posture that reflects worship. And so if you can, if you're physically able, if you can bow low, I wanna invite you to do that. And let's ask God to speak to us today. So Father in heaven, we're, we're gathered together here because we need to hear from you. And in this room, you've gathered people who have been walking with you for years and some who are very far from you right now. But we're all here together. And God, we need you to speak in a mighty, powerful way. We need you to speak. God, I pray that you would show up in our lives for your glory. God, we believe that you are the one true God, that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to be crucified on a cross for us, to be raised from the dead. We believe he offers new life and hope and healing. So God, I want to pray right now for those who've come into this room and they need help. They need healing. God, would you please bring the healing that we need? God, I pray that you would be glorified in everything that happens here. We want you to get all the attention, all the glory, and all the honor. We're honored to be in this place together. So God, would you show up in a mighty, powerful way? Speak to us. We're listening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, Christians all over the world are celebrating Palm Sunday. The name Palm Sunday comes from when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and people laid down palm branches along the path for him. You can read about this in your Bible in Matthew chapter 21 and Luke chapter 19. Jesus and his disciples had just come through Jericho where Jesus had met the little man, Zacchaeus, and also healed two blind men. As they got close to Jerusalem, Jesus sent some of his disciples on ahead and told them to find a donkey for him to ride. It had to be a donkey that no one had ever ridden before. When the donkey's owner asked why the disciples were untying their donkey, the disciples were to tell the owner, the Lord needs it. Jesus rode the donkey to fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah from 600 years earlier. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, not only did people lay down palm branches, their cloaks, and other things to line the way, they also shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna means, O oh, save us. The day this happened was the beginning of the Passover week for the Jews, and it was also the day people traditionally chose their lamb for the Passover sacrifice. The people cheering for Jesus wanted him to deliver them from their oppressors, the Roman Empire. But Jesus would save them in a different way, as the Lamb of God to take away their sins. In fact, Jesus was so concerned with the people's lack of faith and understanding that he wept over the whole city. Today, we celebrate Palm Sunday because we know the whole story, the gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again on the third day. And if we believe in him, we can have eternal life. stand and worship together. Let's sing to the King of Kings. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three Hey! 
Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in. We sang this song last week, and it says that my help comes from the Lord. Come on, we believe that, and we sing that this morning. We sing. Oh, my soul, forget not all his benefits. How his light shone through darker days than this. He has been faithful. He's always faithful. Even as I'm walking through the wilderness Standing in the valley, I'll remember this He has been faithful, He's always faithful And do we believe that? Because I know where my help comes from My help comes from the Lord I know where my help comes from My help comes from confidence remains in the name above all names I know where my help comes from my help comes from the Lord yes it does no I won't fear the fire or the wind and waves for the name I call upon will be the same Jesus is He's always faithful. Yes, I know. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. My confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from. Confidence, confidence remains in the name 
above all names. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. Yes, it does. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. My confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And I live my countenance. Yes, I do, Jesus. We are. Thank you, Pastor Dean. That's better, right? You know, God is so worthy of our praise, isn't he? When we sing that song, we can sing it with our whole hearts because he is worthy. And we are here to worship him. We're here to pray. We're here to learn his word. We're here to encourage each other and fellowship with each other. It's such a blessing to be able to come to church and be together like this. In a moment, we're going to go ahead and take our offering that funds what God is doing here at church. And I just want to encourage you to make sure you fill out your Connect card. This is a great time when the plates are passed to be able to drop it in there. And every week, these prayer requests get prayed over by our entire staff as we gather for Staff Chapel. Every week, we pray over about 250 to 300 cards, and we'd love to have 1,000 especially as we're leading up to Easter, I challenge you to write down some names of people that you are inviting to worship with us on Easter Sunday. And along with you, we're going to pray for them. And we're going to pray that God would bring the masses to our church next weekend so we could share the gospel with them about how Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. So the guys can go ahead and come down forward. We're going to re uh, receive our offering. And I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you, God, so much for what you're doing here in this place. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your spirit that energizes our worship. Thank you so much, God. Man, we love you with all of our hearts. And, and we pray that you would fill this place, both services, overflowing with people hungry to hear about Jesus, hungry to have their, their brokenness restored to your design, hungry to find purpose in life. God in heaven, do a work here. Thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing through our offering. We pray that every penny would go for your glory and people's good. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. I'm Ashlyn. Thank you for being here. 
If you're new, welcome to Indian Rocks. We would love to get to know you, so stop by the Connection Center in the lobby after service. You can also fill out the Connect card at the bottom of your listening guide and drop it in the offering buckets or at the boxes at the exits. Also on that Connect card, there's a place for you to put a prayer request. Every week, our staff takes the time to pray over each card and for you by name. So let's see what's coming up in our church. Easter is coming and we cannot wait. Have you invited someone to sit with you? Grab your pack of Easter invite cards, write your name and contact information inside, and share the good news of Jesus right here in Pinellas County. And remember that this Friday is our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. This is a powerful service that you do not want to miss. Visit indianrocks.org forward slash Easter for more information. If you're new around here, join us for the Next Steps Lunch. This is a time to not only hear how God is moving through our church and church family, but also a time for us to hear your story. For more information, head to indianrocks.org forward slash next steps. Our campus is changing. Are you curious about what's happening? Visit indianrocks.org forward slash construction for more information. We are so happy that you chose to be with us today. Now it's time for our Bible study. We invite you to grab your listening guide, pen, and Bible. As we get ready to lean in, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And parents, if you have little ones and you need to slip out, no worries. We have volunteers in the lobby who can show you a great spot to watch service in a more kid-friendly area. Thank you for being here as we discuss Palm Sunday. Good morning. Let's sing this together. I know where my help comes from. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And what a great reminder this morning. Let me pray for us. Lord, we're grateful to be together. And now as we open your word, I pray that you would remind us that our help truly comes from you. Our help doesn't come from a TED talk. It doesn't come from a motivational speech. My help comes from the Lord. You are strong and mighty. Your word is clear. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts deep to the joints and the marrow, to the very heart of what we need to hear. So God, Would you open your word to our heart and open our hearts to your word? We want to hear from you because my help comes from the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Aaron and I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And we're going to go ahead and have our Bible study. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and get your Bible out, turn your Bible on. We're going to be in John chapter 12, John chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, maybe you want to get your smartphone out and download a Bible app so that you can follow along with us. And every week when we get together, we're going to open God's Word because we believe that our help truly does come from the Lord, and we want to study His Word. That's what this is. This is a Bible study that we're having together. Now, many of you are believers. Many of you are leaning into your faith. That's why you're here today. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever asked God for a sign? Anybody ever asked God to give you a sign for something? Come on now, be honest. Sure you have. We all have. We want God to show up. We want God to give us a sign. Usually when we're trying to make a big decision, we're asking God for some kind of evidence. Give us assurance. We want confidence in knowing that this is the right decision. Maybe it's a relationship decision. God, I need a sign. Is he the one? Is she the one? God, I need a sign. Maybe it's a financial decision. God, we're looking at buying this house, buying this car. Either one of those, very difficult in this environment. God, we need a sign. Would you please show us a sign? Maybe it has to do with a career choice, your job. God, we need a sign. Would you please show us a sign? I want to make a good decision. I want to please you. Now, some people take this line of thinking over the edge into what I like to call mystical superstitious, religious gobbledygook. You know what I'm talking about? Where they're just looking for a sign everywhere, God. If the orange doesn't fall out of that tree in the next three seconds, it's got to be from you. You know what I'm talking about? God, if those birds are still on the power line after I get done praying, that's a sign from you. God, would you write it in the sky? Would you put it on the sands of the shore? God, I need a sign. Some people do what I like to call um, theological roulette. 
and they'll take their Bible and they'll shake it like a magic eight ball. They say, oh Lord, I just need a verse. I just need a verse. I've never really studied the Bible before, but Lord, give me a good one. Give me a good one. And you just open it up and it's like, oh, okay. Second Samuel 24. And David went into the cave and he relieved himself. Lord, is that what you want me to do? <laughs> I'm just looking for a sign. I just need a sign from the Lord. Some of you remember a few years ago, there was an office building in Tampa. And after the landscapers removed a tree that had been there for years, the sprinklers left a chemical residue on the, the glass building, and it resembled an outline of the Virgin Mary. You guys remember? How many of you guys remember this story being in the news? Yeah, it was big time. I wasn't even living here in Tampa, and I remember this, this story. Hundreds of thousands of people traveled from all over the world to come see this miraculous sign from the Lord. And then investors ended up buying this building, and on the second floor of the building, they opened up a factory to build rosary beads. And they would build them right here on the second floor of this building and send them all over the world. And people started gathering outside of the building, and they were having worship services every single day right outside that building. And that went on for seven years until a troubled teenager. It's always the teenagers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> troubled teenager with a high-powered slingshot and a pocket full of ball bearings decided to put one right between Mary's eyes. <laughs> Shattered the glass. People are always looking for a sign, and you might think, oh man, that's crazy. Who would show up to worship at a building that was stained by sprinklers? I mean, that is crazy, but that's not nearly as crazy as this. Um, down in Fort Lauderdale, there was a woman named Diana Dicer, and after buying a loaf of white bread and some Land O'Lakes American cheese from Publix in 1994, she received a special visit. From who? The Virgin Mary, of course. Where did she appear? On her grilled cheese sandwich. Right there. So Diana carefully tucked the sandwich away into a plastic box nestled among cotton balls, and she saved it for, get this, a decade. It's like that McDonald's cheeseburger that's sitting in the Smithsonian right now. And so, believing that this miracle shouldn't be kept to herself, it should be shared with the world, she decided to market this grilled cheese sandwich because miraculously, the sandwich hadn't decayed. This is one well-preserved blessed mother right here. In a wild course of events, this uh, greasy cuisine found itself in a bidding war and was eventually purchased by the Golden Palace Casino for $28,000. A year later, one year later, Diana was back at it selling the official holy pan that made the grilled cheese sandwich. I mean, just when you think this story can't get any cheesier. You like that? <laughs> People are desperate for a sign. But, you know, I can't blame them because I do the same thing. I mean, I, I ask God to give me signs all the time. Lord, would you give me confidence and help me know? And I mean, even recently, I, I've been so nervous about Easter next week because we got all these people that are coming, all these guests from our community, they're going to be here. And I, sometimes, you know, preachers, sometimes we get writer's writing block, sermon writer's writing, writer's block. And I was just thinking, Lord, I need a sign. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. We got thousands of people showing up on Easter Sunday. Lord, I just need a, a sign from you. Would you just show me what you want me to talk about? And this week, you won't believe it. God gave me a sign. It's the craziest thing. I'm sitting there eating breakfast, and I look down in my cup of coffee, and you won't believe what the Lord... <laughs> I mean, he just gave... He said, this is what you should talk about on Easter. And then I, I looked at my toast, and it was like... Easter toast right there. It's like Easter bread. I just knew. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you'd be okay with this. Are you guys okay with me talking about the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday? Would that be okay with you guys? It's a sign from the Lord. God gave me a sign. P people are always looking for signs. It's, it's natural because God has hardwired us to know him. And he's woven it into the fabric of our DNA. He wants us to know him, and we feel that impulse on the inside. And that's why Jesus was constantly giving the disciples signs. I mean, when Peter needed a sign, Jesus walked on water. That's a pretty good sign, isn't it? 
I mean, when the disciples needed a sign, Jesus took a man who'd been blind from birth and healed him miraculously. This guy started seeing, like, it was a miracle, an incredible sign. When, when all of the crowds needed a sign, Jesus, he took this little kid's lunchbox that just had a couple of sardines in it and a couple of pieces of bread, and Jesus fed thousands of people. It was an incredible sign. But there was this one sign. When, when you read through the New Testament, there was this one sign that it stands in a class all its own. It's in its own category. It was the sign that was the dividing line. I mean, it was a sign that draws a line in the sand. It makes people say, is you is or is you ain't. This was one of those kinds of signs that really got the people talking. It was the sign of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was a close personal friend of Jesus and today, on Palm Sunday, this marks the official beginning of Holy Week, the triumphal entry. For John, you can't talk about the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday without talking about Lazarus. Because, yeah, the crowds were there to see Jesus. Yeah, the crowds were there to see the miracle worker. Yeah, they wanted to see the miracle man. But really, John points out the crowds are there because they want to see dead man walking. They want to see the walking dead. They want to see Lazarus. Jesus knew Lazarus. Lazarus was not some stranger off the street, not some geek off the street. Some of y'all will get that reference later. <laughs> he was a friend. In fact, this was Martha's brother, Mary's friend. News traveled fast to Jesus about the death of Lazarus. In fact, when he heard the news, Jesus had an emotional response. We learned this a few weeks ago. Some of you memorized your very first verse of Scripture. You guys remember that? When Jesus heard about the death of Lazarus, Jesus wept. He cried. This was an emotional response. This was a friend of his. The healing of Lazarus happened um, right before Passover. So Jesus is on his death march, these are the final days of Jesus' earthly ministry. He receives this terrible news. Jesus, Lazarus is sick. But Jesus remains calm, cool as a cucumber. He says to the disciples, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And I'm sure the disciples were probably like, oh man, thank God, that's good news because we know if Jesus says everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay. Jesus is gonna heal Lazarus. Everything's gonna be okay. All right, guys, pack up camp. We're going to heal Lazarus. Jesus said, Lazarus is gonna be okay. Let's all pack up our things. And they start gathering up all their belongings. And then as they start to leave, they turn around and look and Jesus is just sitting there. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. You said everything was gonna be okay. It's time to go heal Lazarus. You said everything was gonna be okay. And Jesus said everything will be okay. And he stayed. And he didn't just stay for a few minutes or a few hours. He stayed there for a few days. And after a few days, they get word, Lazarus died. And these disciples are befuddled. Jesus, you said everything would be okay. You, you told us everything would be okay, but then you stayed here. We trusted you, Jesus. The disciples, they pack up everything, and they're sad. They start making their journey back to Bethany for a funeral where, where Lazarus was. Now, now, Bethany is really close to Jerusalem, and this is the week before Passover. So you got to remember, sometimes you get mixed up in the timeline of events. This is days before, just about a week before the crucifixion of Jesus. So, so everyone is heading to Jerusalem. It's Passover. All the Jews from all the surrounding region are heading there, and Bethany is really close to Jerusalem. So people are stopping through Bethany to console Mary and Martha. Hey, I'm sorry. We heard about Lazarus. And then Jesus comes through to do the same exact thing. Now, when Martha sees Jesus, she's not happy. Hey, Martha, I'm really sorry. We heard about Lazarus. I even wept. Yeah, Jesus, where were you? Because you said everything would be okay, and if you were here, he'd be alive right now. Where were you, Jesus? Jesus says, your, your friend, your brother, he will rise. And Martha says, I know he's going to rise at the resurrection. She gives some spiritual churchy answer. I know he's going to rise at the resurrection. And Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, I'm the resurrection. He probably didn't hit the pulpit, but he probably said, I'm the resurrection. You're looking at him. It's not just something you memorize. It's not just some spiritual thing that you check the box on. I'm the resurrection. 
He's going to rise. Then Mary comes up, sweet, tender Mary, the one who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears, broke the vial of perfume, Mary. And she says the same thing Martha says, but she just says it in a more tender way. Jesus, if you would have just been here. So Jesus is filled with this emotional response, this passion for his Father's will. He knows it's not supposed to be like this, and he wipes the tears away from his eyes, and he says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Some scholars say the reason why he called Lazarus by name is because if he would have just said, come out, every grave in the world would have been opened. This is the God who made the sun in a day. This is the God who walks on water. Complete power, complete authority, all in bodily form right there. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, you could have heard a pin drop. This is the God who reverses rigor mortis. His body that had been cold and dead began to fill up with life. The King James Version says that he was dead for so long that he stinketh. This is John's way of saying this guy had been dead for a while. And then all of a sudden, in an instant, his lungs fill with air. His veins start pumping full of blood. That cold, dead body has life again. This is an incredible story. I mean, you think about what it must have been like for Lazarus. I mean, this poor guy. This guy gets sick. He's dead. He's in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's in paradise, Abraham's side. He's there in heaven. And then, all of a sudden, he hears this loud voice. Uh, Lazarus, come forth. And then, all of a sudden, his spirit reconnects with his body. He doesn't even really understand it himself. All of a sudden, he realizes, oh, I'm in a grave. He comes out of the grave, and he's seeing all the people. And he's talking with them, and he's eating with them. And now, these religious leaders are so upset with Lazarus. Why? Because the chief priests were Sadducees. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. That's why they were Sadducee. Now you're getting it. Okay. All right, good. So imagine if your entire worldview and your entire religious system had a system where you didn't believe in the resurrection, and then you've got this guy who's been dead for four days, and now he's walking around, eating with you, talking with you, looking at the Sadducees, waving to them, giving them one of those. What are you going to do? Your whole religious system has been debunked with one sign, one miracle, and the whole world changed. This is why the crowds were there because they wanted to see the walking dead man. So, on the Sabbath, one week before the Passover, the day before Jesus rides into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday, he's at a dinner dinner party in Bethany with Lazarus, having a meal with a guy that was just dead. And this is where we pick it up. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, it says this. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, notice this, not only on account of him, that's Jesus, but also to see who? That's why they showed up. That's why they were there with the palm branches. That's why they were there crying, Hosanna. They saw Lazarus, whom he had risen from the dead. Yes, the crowds were there for Passover. Yes, they were there for Jesus, but they wanted to see the sign. They were looking for a sign. Verse 10, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death. This poor guy, he can't catch a break. He's only been alive for five minutes, and they already want to kill him again. Because on the count of him, look at this, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This was a line in the sand kind of miracle. This is one of those signs that made people choose Jesus. Now, The next day, one day later, it's Palm Sunday, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. The word Hosanna literally means save us. What in the world did they want to be saved from? 
Rome, taxation, heavy oppression. This was a, 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 almost a version of legal slavery. God, would you please save us? They were expecting Jesus to come like Alexander the Great, riding in on a Clydesdale, coming in to usher in authority and power and rule to wipe out the Romans, snuff out Nero, snuff out Caesar. Let's get rid of all this Roman oppression. We want the new king. Jesus, come on in and usher in your kingdom. And he didn't come on a Clydesdale. Verse 14, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why, John makes it crystal clear, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this what? Sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, <laughs> you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world's gone after him. Jesus was an unstoppable avalanche disrupting their entire worldview. In the first century in the Greco-Roman world, the Roman mantra was the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, at all costs. You do whatever it takes to keep the peace of Rome. Even if it means you have to kill someone, snuff them out, you keep the peace of Rome. <laughs> How in the world are we going to defeat a leader who has power over death? This guy just raised Lazarus from the dead, and everyone knows it. Everyone sees it. How in the world are we going to keep the peace? This place was like a powder keg just waiting for a spark. You can feel the tension. If you have your listening guide, let's go ahead and jot down a few notes. What can we learn about Palm Sunday from the book of John? What can we learn? Number one is this, that the empty tomb is a sign for you. The empty tomb is a sign for you. These people needed a sign. They were looking for a sign. They got a sign. People today are looking for a sign. We have a sign. It's the empty tomb. We've been given this sign. They were under Roman oppression. They were praying for a deliverer. And the empty tomb of Lazarus was a sign that this Jesus could be the one. He could be the Messiah, the leader we've been praying for. You see, they, they thought Jesus was coming to usher in this political reign, this political kingdom. They were looking at the wrong empty tomb. We're New Testament believers. And so we can't unknow what we already know. Yes, this is a story about an empty tomb, but we know a story about another empty tomb, a more powerful empty tomb. You see, the death of Lazarus just points us to the death of Jesus. We know that just as Lazarus died, Jesus died. But Lazarus died only, Lazarus was raised from the dead only to die again. Jesus was raised from the dead and he will never die. He died once for all, never to die again. He is eternal. You know, it's funny, Lazarus never shows up again in the Bible after this. You know why? Because they killed him. They killed him, probably right around the time they killed Jesus. He doesn't show up after the resurrection. He doesn't show up at the Great Commission. He doesn't show up at Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. He doesn't show up in the road to Emmaus. He doesn't show up anywhere else in the book of Acts. He doesn't show up anywhere else in the Bible. You know why? Because they killed him. But Jesus was raised to life, never to be killed again. He's alive right now. In the empty tomb, that's your sign. In the words of Jeff Foxworthy, here's your sign. Quit looking at stained glass buildings. Quit looking in the sky. Quit looking in the sand. Here's your sign. It was given to you 2,000 years ago that the God of the universe sent his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be crucified on a cross for your sin and for mine. He was buried, and three days later, he was raised from the dead. So the empty tomb is a sign for you. You looking for a sign? Here's your sign. Resurrection of Jesus is eternal, never to die again. Signs matter. They point you in the right direction. I meet people all the time, and I, and I ask them, hey, how did you find our church? How did you find us? I mean, gosh, you live all the way on the other side of town. How did you find this church? And they'll say, oh, pastor, we saw the signs. 
Now, they're not trying to give some kind of mystical spiritual response. They literally saw the signs on Almerton Road. There's a sign out there. It says church. Signs point you somewhere. That's their job. They're trying to point you in the right direction. When I, um, when I moved from Florida to Kentucky, I got lost all the time. You know, navigating Florida is pretty easy. You got ocean on one side, land on the other. It's usually north, south, east, west. It's on a grid. It's really easy to get around. Like, I, I know my way around Florida. I'm a Florida kid. When I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, their roads are all in circles. And I got lost all the time. This was before GPS, and I remember being so frustrated. I would get lost all the time. There's this one road. It's called I-64, Interstate 64. And if you're ever going east on I-64, there, there is this one sign that says Simpsonville, 12 miles ahead. And if you miss your exit, the next exit is Simpsonville, 12 miles ahead. There's no turnarounds. There's no roundabouts. There's no ways to get off. If you miss your exit, you're going to Simpsonville. I hated Simpsonville. <laughs> Never wanted to go to Simpsonville. It's a terrible, terrible place. Now, look, I'm sure the people of Simpsonville that are watching us online right now, I'm sure you're nice people. That is a crummy town, a crummy town. I never wanted to go to your town. Got stuck in Simpsonville many, many times. Never intended to go there, didn't mean to go there, but all of a sudden, there I am. You know, some of you are in spiritual Simpsonville right now. You're in a place that you never intended to go. You're not even really sure how you got there. You missed some signs way back here, and now you just feel like you're stuck in Simpsonville. Hey, if that's you, if you feel like you've drifted really, really far, you're in a place you never thought you would go, you're doing things you never thought you would do, you're with people you didn't even want to be with, if that's you, here's your sign. The empty tomb is telling you, turn around. Turn around. Get back in your car. Turn around. The empty tomb reminds you that Jesus was crucified for you. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even if you're in a far off place, even if you didn't mean to go there, even if you don't like being there, turn around. You can come back to Christ right now. And if you want a sign for that, here's your sign. Empty tomb. Empty tomb. Jesus was raised from the dead, so you don't have to stay in the place where you're at right now. You might say, yeah, you don't know anything about me. You don't even know where I was last night. Don't need to, don't want to. Come home. Jesus is calling you home right now. The reason you're here, the reason why God has you in church right now is to remind you that the empty tomb is a sign for you, calling you to come home. Number two, write this down. New life is available for you. New life is available for you. If you need to turn around, you need new life. You feel it, you know it, you've tried doing things your own way, you need new life. When I was about 30 years old, I felt like God was calling me to deepen my education and so, so I went into a doctoral program. And before they let me into the program, I had to do all kinds of leveling work. That's a nice way of saying, you didn't do good in your master's degree, you need to take some more classes over again. I had to interview to be in this program. I had to apply. I had to do a bunch of papers and write a bunch of things. I had to do a lot of work just to get into this program. And it was a rigorous program, lots of intense reading, hard coursework, challenging program. Then I get there and I get into my first doctoral cohort. And I do what every man does. I'm looking around and I'm sizing up the room and I start to realize these people are a lot smarter than me. This guy over here, he's an egghead. That guy's a nerd. These guys are brainiacs. That guy's a literal genius. That guy's a genius. And I'm realizing I don't belong here. You ever felt that way? And you start looking around and you're realizing, oh my goodness, these people are all smarter than me. Aaron, you barely graduated from Mulberry High School. You graduated reading at a sixth grade reading level. You're the only person in your family that ever went to college. You don't belong here. What are you doing in this doctoral program? And then the professor, he got up my first day of class and he said, some of you feel like you don't belong here. 
Kind of like how some of you feel on a Sunday morning. And all of a sudden I realize my cover's blown. This guy knows who I am. Like, how did he know that? Just like how some of you come up to me on Sunday and you're like, did my wife call you? No, she didn't call me. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. He said, some of you feel like you don't belong here, but let me just remind you, you have applied, you have interviewed, some of you, and he kind of looked at me, have done leveling work. I'm like, oh, he knows. But you're here because we believe in you. You are here because you were invited into this program. You feel like you have imposter syndrome, but you're not an imposter. You're here not because you believe in you, but because we believe in you. Some of you feel that way about this church. You walk around, you see all these spiritual Christians, you see that guy that carries that gigantic Bible, I mean, it's so big. You think, man, these guys are like SEAL Team 6 Christians. They're even memorizing scripture. When the bucket goes by, they're giving money. These people get on their knees. These are like some of the most serious Christians I've ever met. I don't belong here. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, because anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you might feel like you're in the pit of brokenness. You might feel like you don't belong. Listen to me, that's the devil. The devil's trying to tell you you don't belong, but let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're a child of God, you have royalty flowing through your veins. You have a king who loves you, who made you, who brought you to life, who wants to redeem you by the precious blood of his son. You belong here. Think about of all the places you could be in the world right now, God's got you in a church. You think that's by accident? God brought you here. You're not an imposter. Now, you may be in Simpsonville. <laughs> Turn around. Repent. Submit to Christ. Bow down to him. Worship him. Give your life to him. Let him be in the driver's seat of your life. You won't believe what he'll do with your life. God is inviting you in. He's given you new life. It's available to you. This is why John said in chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him. Whoever. You know who that whoever is? You know who that whosoever is? It's you. It's me. We're just a bunch of beggars who found the bread, and we're trying to show other people where we found it. That's who we are. God's inviting you in. That's why, this is why in John eleven twenty six 26, it says, everyone who believes in me shall never die. He's trying to give you a new life. In John chapter 20, at the end of his gospel, he reminds us who this whole book is for, who the book of John is for. He says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have new life in his name. New life. Man, get rid of that old life. Get out of Simpsonville. Turn around and run to Jesus. He is calling you right now. The empty tomb, it's a sign for you. New life, it's available to you. Number three, but believing is up to you. I so wish, I so wish I could believe for you. I would. If there was a way for me to do that, I would do it but I can't. Believing is up to you. You have to choose to believe. You have to choose to submit your life to Christ, to submit to the lordship of Jesus in your life. Total submission. You have to choose that. When I was a kid growing up over in, in Lakeland, I have three brothers, and we like to play board games a lot. And one of my favorite board games was checkers. And there's this thing that happens in the game of checkers. If you, can, if you can get your checker to maneuver all the way across the board and get to the other side of the board, there's this thing that happens where you get to say these two marvelous words. You get to say to your opponent, king me. And your opponent has to take one of those checkers that he took from you, and he flips it over. And on the other side, there's a crown, and he puts that on top of your checker. And then all of a sudden, that checker, it gets new rules. It gets to move anywhere it wants all over the board. It can go forward, backwards, diagonal. It's amazing what happens because the king goes wherever he wants. You have to choose to let Jesus be the king of your life. Only you can choose it. But when you choose to let the king come in, when you crown him as king in your life, he gets to go anywhere. He goes into your thought life. He goes into your finance life. He goes into your relationship life. He gets to go anywhere because the king gets to move anywhere throughout your life. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? 
Or is he just something you do on Sundays a couple times a month? Is he really the Lord of your life? Have you allowed him to come in? Have you said to Jesus, I want you to be the king? When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, some people were crying out, Hosanna. And then just a few hours later, they cried out, crucify. When Jesus rides into your life, you're either going to have to cross him or king him. You give him the cross or you give him a crown, which one's it going to be? Because there's no room in between. The miracle of Lazarus shows us that there's a line drawn in the sand and you can't straddle the line. There's no murky middle when it comes to Jesus. You're either going to make him the king, the Lord of your life, or you're just going to crucify him. Which one are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? Have you given him the right to be the Lord of your life? He's either your Lord or he's nothing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we conclude our Bible study? I want you to think about your own life, the relationship you have with Jesus. You're not here by accident. God has you listening to this message on purpose and for a purpose. Your very presence here is a sign that God is not mad at you. He is mad about you. He loves you so much. He's crazy for you. And he made all the conditions right for you to be right here hearing this message today. I mean, think about it. Of all the places you could be today, God's got you here. I have to believe it's on purpose and it's for purpose. I have to believe that people are constantly looking at all the wrong signs. They're asking God, write it in the sky, write it on the sand. But God gave us a sign. It's the empty tomb. And he's trying to show you how much he loves you. 2,000 years ago, God sent his one and only son to die on the cross for your sins, to be raised from the dead. And right now, he wants you to receive him by faith. He wants to save you. Some of you come into this room today, and you know you need salvation. And in your heart, you're crying out, just like those people did in Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Save me, Lord. The Bible says if you cry out to him in faith, he will come in and he'll save you. He'll rescue you. In fact, if you're here in this room today and you'd say, I need the Lord Jesus to come into my life right now. I need him to save me. Would you just slip your hand up wherever you are? Just raise your hand. Say, I need the Lord Jesus to save me. Okay, a lot of hands, a lot of people. I need the Lord Jesus to come in. I need salvation right now. I need him to save me. Okay, I see you all the way up in the mezzanine. I see you. All right, I see you. I need Jesus to save me. Lord Jesus, we're believing in you. These hands that are lifted up to you, they are reaching out in faith. God, we know that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God, I want to pray right now for these men and women, these boys and girls that are lifting their hand to you. Would you meet them today? God, would you come into their hearts, into their lives, forgive them of their sins, Help them to turn around. Some of them feel like they're in spiritual Simpsonville. They're just so lost. They didn't even mean to go there. God, would you bring them back? Help them to recover and pursue you today. God, we believe that Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sin, that he was buried, that God raised him from the dead. And so just like Jesus rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, God, I pray that he would ride into our hearts and change us forever. And I pray that that would happen today. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. 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 At this time, you're going to see a couple people that are leaving the auditorium because they're getting in their positions of serving, and our prayer team's going to go ahead and come down front at this time. But don't let it distract you if God is working in your heart. A lot of hands went up, and I have a feeling there's a lot of people that might have been a little nervous about raising their hands, but I encourage you, if God is working in this moment, don't let it pass. Come on down front. Pastor Aaron's going to be down here, myself, some other pastors, our prayer team are going to be here, and we'd love to hear your story, and we'd love to pray with you. 
Uh, so please, don't let the moment pass. Also, if maybe you're interested in joining the church or getting baptized or getting in a group, you can also visit us in the Connection Center, that glass room out in the lobby, and there's a wonderful team of people that would love to speak with you. And then, of course, as you leave, you're going to be getting these Easter invite cards. And this is an awesome way to bring people here to hear the message, the hopeful message of Jesus rising from the dead. So it's going to be an awesome week next week. We hope to see you there. It's been an awesome morning today, hasn't it? Let's go ahead and stand up. God bless you. We've been the church in here this morning. So let's go be the church out there. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Stepping